Okay. Second. Second. The, uh, the uh, feedback is coming from another computer in my house. I'm just looking at this. Uh, okay. I actually, so, like the effect. <laughs> could, could you turn on your volume now? Okay, so I am Talia Liadari. I am married to Tim Abbott, but I'm also the director of programming at the Great Barrington Libraries. And it's my pleasure to introduce Tim to you. He is, I'm sorry, I'm hearing my voice coming out of his computer. So I'm just gonna go away for a moment. <laughs> Tim Abbott is a Revolutionary War reenactor and local historian who lives in Canaan, Connecticut. He is president of Colonel Ogden's 1st New Jersey Regiment and regularly volunteers for public history interpretive events with the Newport Historical Society, Museum of the American Revolution, and Fort Ticonderoga. His 2010 paper, Documentary Evidence of the Route and Encampments of the Convention Army in Connecticut, was adapted for inclusion in the collections of the David Library of the American Revolution. Earlier this year, he presented his research on the final fight of Shays' Rebellion at the annual Shays Symposium in Springfield and as part of the Great Barrington Library's occasional Zoom history presentations. Tonight he, present, pre, uh, excuse me. Tonight he presents new research into the circumstances that led to the decisive defeat of militia troops from Western Massachusetts at the Battle of Stone Arabia in New York's Hudson Valley and its impact on local communities. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Taya. And since I wrote that, clearly I meant Mohawk Valley. So beat me, well beat me up uh, for, for a typo in the beginning. Thank you, everybody. It's, it's, we have a bit of an echo. And I think I'm going to ask Taya to actually turn her computer off. Um, but we'll take it from here. Somebody asked me how I got interested in John Brown. And uh, so let's let's start with that. I'm gonna show the first screen and we'll take it from there. If people would be kind enough to mute, that'll probably help. All right, um, I got interested in John Brown because I knew what he did at Ticonderoga and he's a local boy from Pittsfield, Mass up the road. And I knew something really horrible happened to him. And uh, not only that, it happened to a bunch of local men from Western Massachusetts, I assumed at the time, largely from Berkshire County. Turns out that there is a Pioneer Valley part of this story as well. Um, and those of you who know me know that um, I'm kind of like a, a terrier after a rat when, when I get curious about something. So I, I've spent the last three months um, standing on some very tall shoulders, uh, not the least of which are the Fort Plain Museum and uh, Historical Society, uh, which, uh, Fort, which has done just tremendous uh, research and stewardship and care of the whole uh, Central Mohawk Valley and its, its history and this history. Um, and also Gavin Watts' uh, tremendous book, uh, The Burning of the Valleys, which has had a couple of, um, a couple of editions. Um, I've tinkered a bit with some of that data and I'm going to offer one or two variations on some conclusions that others have drawn. Um, but what I really did is a very deep dive into the pension records of Massachusetts troops and spent a lot of time trying to, to understand who, which communities were affected, who was involved, and then get into some of those fun questions like uh, why did it happen and was Brown betrayed and all those other fun aspects of the history, some of which I'm not gonna be able to answer for you, but might be able to add um, a little more data. So let's, let's begin. I'll try, and, I'll try and move this along. There, there will be some text, but I will read it engagingly in its original language, so for fun. Um, I've called this Brown's defeat a bad day for Western Massachusetts in the Revolutionary War. It wasn't a super great day for seven or eight uh, Oneida Indians and uh, uh, local Tryon County militia either. 
Um, but the, the really bad casualties at uh, Stone Arabia on that day were suffered by Berkshire and, and uh, Hampshire County, Massachusetts. That uh, image you're looking at there that says Stone Arabia on it, that's a, uh, a reproduction of a map horn, powder horn that had uh, a depiction of this settlement, including one of its two soon to be burned churches uh, dating from the 1750s. And on the right, um, uh, a recent battlefield uh, marker uh, near the site where the engagement took place um, that rightly points out that New York was there as well. Here's a monument you can't see right now if you're in Pittsfield um, because they're uh, completely digging up the facade of the Pittsfield Museum. But uh, out in front of that, there is or was a stone uh, that wanted us all to know that Easton's Tavern was there and that one John Brown of Pittsfield and uh, some other fine fellows um, met there when they decided it'd be a good idea to go to the Hampshire Grants and uh, help capture Fort Ticonderoga. Notice that uh, Easton, local boy, is named as second in command under Ethan Allen. No mention of Benedict Arnold because we're all partisan here. So there's another little monument to him that's sort of hanging out there um, that, that got me wondering about him. So who was this guy? Most, most people who aren't Revolutionary War nuts only know one John Brown and he now has a new mini series and he was born in Torrington, Connecticut and he's an interesting case, but he's not the guy we're talking about. Um, who were the men uh, who served with him from Western Mass on the New York frontier? And that's an interesting conversation we'll have. They were, they were three months state levies and uh, we know a good deal more about them as individuals uh, in part for some digging I did. Um, why were they in the Mohawk Valley at this time? And uh, where were they? Were they concentrated or were they spread around? Uh, just how many men did Brown have with him? Forgive me, I believe I'm looking at somebody else's screen. I'd rather not do that. Let's go back to mine. Um, just a second. How many men did he have with him uh, at that time? And uh, that's an important question because he either was betrayed or he was caught in a meeting engagement and was not facing overwhelming numbers. And we'll dig into that. Um, why did so many men die? Why was this, if not a massacre, then a resounding defeat for his force? And what was the impact of that on the communities out here in Western Massachusetts who lost sons and brothers and husbands and, and was it a heavy hit in any particular community or not? And that question might have been as interesting to me as any others, and I can add some insights to that. So here's a little bit on John Brown. Born in Haverhill, uh, but moved to Sandusfield in Berkshire County with his family when he was eight. Uh, Hulda Kilborn, his uh, wife, was also from Sandusfield. And at some point uh, in the early 1770s uh, or late 1760s, they married and had seven children, at least three who lived. Graduated Yale in 1771. He's a little old for Yale um, if he was born in 1774. They, they were graduating a much younger at that time, which is curious. And then he very briefly uh, practiced law in two places, one in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, under irony of ironies, his uh, uh, brother-in-law, Oliver Arnold, who's a cousin of Benedict, his sister married that fellow first encounter, but not the last with Benedict Arnold. Um, then he's very briefly an attorney in the very part of the Mohawk Valley that he ends up dying in later, but he's in Pittsfield by 1773, so it's not long. And he's obviously made enough of a name for himself that he's a delegate to the County Congress in Stockbridge in 74, and he gets himself involved in the Provincial Congress at Concord um, later that year when he proposes one of what becomes two spying missions that he leads up into Canada, uh, the first on the behalf of the Committee of Correspondence. And just for fun, here's a bit of his report when he came back in end of March, 1775. So weeks before hostilities break out at Lexington and Concord. And I'm highlighting two parts of this. It's otherwise nice language. He's clearly gifted with a pen. Um, and he had to deal with ice and bad travel. Of course he did. but. He gives some insight into why the Canadians weren't super likely to send delegates to Congress, and it's all about trade. It's all about if, uh, if they boycott British goods, 
then uh, <laughs> the French will have an advantage and none of them want that. Um, and then he says this famous thing that sounds like he's a pretty knowledgeable fellow from afar. Uh, One thing I must mention to be kept as a profound secret, the fort at Ticonderoga must be seized as soon as possible should hostilities be committed. And by the way, the Hampshire Grant spoke. So indeed, uh, I think several people, there was a, a co-evolution of this idea, but several people thought this might not be the worst plan in the world. Brown is certainly one who put pen to paper on that early on, as we see he did uh, go on um, with Easton uh, up to help um, Ethan Allen and others. He was paid uh, for 14 days service by Connecticut because one of the things that happened in that tavern in Pittsfield is um, they agreed to uh, take on the charge on behalf of the colony of Connecticut, which was sending some men northward. Um, so he got two weeks pay for this. And then he got a real um, break. He was sent to bring the news to Congress, to bring dispatches uh, announcing the capture of the fort. Now that's usually how you get promoted at this time. It took a little while for his promotion to become continental, but he was appointed a major in Easton's regiment from Massachusetts shortly thereafter, and he made a second spying mission into Canada, this time after hostilities took place. Um, posing, I believe, as a, a trader in horses, people thought it was a little suspicious that he wasn't buying or selling any. Um, he did come back um, and, and was urging an invasion. He distinguished himself uh, during the fall, uh, particularly uh, in October with the uh, uh, capture of Fort Chambly, um, which helped open up the path to Montreal. Um, and then he's in front of Quebec uh, in that fateful night where there are actually four attacks made on the walls, two big ones that are meant to get somewhere and two diversions. He's leading one of the diversions. Of course, it's a disaster uh, for um, Benedict Arnold's force and for Montgomery's force. And he's still there in February. So it's, it's brutally cold, 1776. The, the, the army is stalled, there's smallpox starting, and he's a major of Massachusetts and Vermont militia at that time. Sometime thereafter, he finally gets his award from Congress. He's made a lieutenant colonel in a Continental Regiment. It's Samuel Elmore's regiment, an un uh, numbered regiment, largely Connecticut troops. It's not clear he spent much time with Elmore. Um, his commission was confirmed uh, in August, although it was to rank to um, December of 75. And he did offer his resignation about the time the regiment disbanded, uh, February 22nd, 1777, but not before uh, forming a rather strong sense that he was entitled to more. Uh, as so many officers of the time were for their services than he had perhaps received, and also a very bad opinion of Benedict Arnold. And I'm telling you this to give you a sense of his temperament. He in fact petitioned Congress um, that they take uh, cognizance of his many contributions back in 1775 and was hoping that they might prefer him more than they had. And here's a long response from the committee uh, the key points to note are that while they do feel he did indeed do some very good things, they also feel like making him a lieutenant colonel promoted for major was sufficient. And, and the part in red is interesting, I think he went snow blind because his eyesight was so impaired by the cold weather last winter that he will not be able to perform the duty of his office unless in some stationary post. Brown wore glasses for the rest of his brief life, uh, but it definitely did not stop him from being an active officer. It also did not stop him from picking a big public fight with Benedict Arnold. And uh, that quote on the top is the one that, that really got um, people's attention. Money is this man's God and to get enough of it, he would sacrifice his country. He's saying that in a broadside he published in Pittsfield on what happens to be my birthday um, in 1777. At the same time that he's hoping um, to, to do something more than just be a, a former Lieutenant Colonel from Elmer's <laughs> regiment. <laughs> And this prompted Arnold to go straight to Congress to clear his name. And Arnold did that at a time when he was, uh, he had already gotten through the Battle of Plattsburgh. He was already grumpy about not having been made a major general, uh, but he's also now the hero of Danbury. So uh, much to, to the poor timing of John Brown, he arrives uh, in Congress and argues that Brown has basically slandered him. Brown did not learn 
that Congress had basically a, a, absolved uh, Arnold of any of the charges that Brown had laid of him. And they were the kind you'd expect, that he was impecunious and he was abusing um, the public trust and that, he, you know, all of those sorts of things that people accused each other of. And that may well have been true. Um, but they quite quickly referred it to the Board of War that basically said on the uh, advice of just one person that, uh, you know, this is just groundless aspersions. And Brown, unfortunately, didn't hear of that until two years later. And he wrote an enormous pissed off letter to Congress, a piece of it, which is here, basically saying this is the most absurd trial he's ever heard of because there were no parties to argue and they didn't hear any charges. And, and actually, Congress had no jurisdiction because it was a military matter. Didn't matter at this point, um, it was sour grapes. Uh, but he was clearly somebody who um, took offense who felt strongly in the right, for whom honor was important. In other words, he was like half the Continental officers that existed. Um, but the guy he, he picked a fight with was at that point um, in favor and Brown was sidelined, but not so sidelined. He still had opportunities in Massachusetts. So he was appointed Colonel um, in April, right before he put out his broadside of 1777. Uh, of the third or middle regiment of Berkshire militia. Berkshire County has a North County, a South County, and a middle. Middle is Pittsfield and some things around it. So he's the Colonel of that. Um, and indeed leads a daring raid um, during Burgoyne's campaign uh, in which he very nearly is able to dispossess the British of Ticonderoga, certainly gains the heights and shells them, captures some, uh, frees some, some continental prisoners, captures some other prisoners, uh, makes a makes a nice demonstration at the time that Burgoyne is holed up um, in uh, the vicinity of Saratoga, and Washington acknowledges him in general orders, and and uh, although he adds an e to his name, everybody knew who he was talking about, and uh, so it turns out that having glasses uh, doesn't stop you from being an active officer if you have a will. So that's Brown. This is the area he eventually ends up. Um, meeting his sad fate. This is uh, a central part of the Mohawk Valley, uh, a map that dates from the 1750s. Right in the middle of the screen there, you can see, see uh, Stone Arabia, um, a very curious name that lots of people mispronounce and spell different ways, um, as one of the settlements. Um, if you've driven or know that area or live in that area, um, you can see here that we have heights of land and a narrow fertile river valley. Um, we have Canajahari. Uh, we have actually the New York Thruway. Um, we have a place called um, um, uh, the, the Nose here where the, the two um, cliffs come very close to the river. Um, and, it's, and it's an area that was important for the easternmost of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawk, um, it was important for Sir John Johnson and um, others uh, of that um, family that had been involved as Indian agents for the British and all of whom uh, were loyalists uh, and loyalist officers during the war. Um, it's a place where German settlers um, were, were placed. And in fact, the name Stone Arabia might come, might come from uh, a corruption of the German Steen Rabi maybe stone fence, something along those lines, hard to tell. There's not something I'm gonna resolve for you, but it gets that name perhaps from that. Um, so it's a mixed area. Um, it's an area that, that is strategically important uh, for reasons you might remember um, if you're as old as I from the way that the revolution was taught when we were in school. So let's quickly go through the New York frontier and all the crazy stuff that happened there prior to, to Brown's disaster. Let's start with Burgoyne and St. Ledger. This is that famous two or possibly three-pronged movement to separate the New England um, rebellious colonies from the middle colonies. John Burgoyne making a second attempt uh, on Albany, supported by Barry St. Ledger, uh, who would travel along the St. Lawrence um, from uh, Montreal and then from Oswego, come down into the Mohawk Valley. Uh, countered perhaps um, by um, both continental and uh, increasingly as we get into September um, militia forces and 
for the purposes of our discussion, um, several things happen in this valley. The, the, the siege of Fort Stanwix, um, which among other things leads uh, many local men in the Tryon County militia under General Herkimer to go to its relief. Um, there is a savage fight at the Battle of Oriskany, uh, a, a fight that includes um, uh, Iroquois fighting Iroquois and neighbor fighting neighbor, and um, that definitely depleted the militia capabilities um, in Tryon County thereafter. They never were able to muster quite the numbers that they had at this time because they had had a very bloody fight. At the same time, belatedly, um, British General Clinton makes a demonstration up the Hudson. It's as far as Kingston, which he burns, but isn't going to be able to get Burgoyne out of trouble. Um, there are the battles at Saratoga and the ultimate surrender of Burgoyne's troops uh, in the Convention of Saratoga um, that ends that campaign with the capture of his army. But that's not the end of it. Because now it's 1778, it's an era of raids and reprisals. Um, this is interesting because um, the customary way for Americans to tell the story is about two big massacres, but there's stuff in between. So Wyoming, um, known to several folks on this call as a place to get good sausages and have a good party, but also a very um, uh, savage fight. Um, which was down in the uh, Wilkes-Barre area of, of Pennsylvania, but a major force of um, loyalist and native allies um, of the crown um, and a very high number of casualties in that disputed area, um, followed up by um, reprisals by um, uh, American militia, Patriot militia on loyalist parts of the frontier, including where the Butler families strongholds were by Unadilla um, and, and nearby um, on Aquaga. These are places that are within um, Iroquois territory, but also where there was a large Scottish um, settlement <laughs> and many of the Scots, many of the Scots um, were loyalists and were targets for loyalist recruits even as late as 1780. And then there's Cherry Valley in, in the later part of the year in November uh, some Massachusetts troops are killed there as well. So we have attacks and counterattacks and things that are called massacres and things that are savage and bloody and not nice going on back and forth during 1778. And the upshot is that Washington finally sends a punitive expedition in 1779, the Clinton-Sullivan expedition, deep into the country of the Six Nations, into the heart of Iroquois. Um, and that involves a two-pronged movement three brigades worth of uh, continental soldiers, including the New Jersey Brigade, uh, including Pennsylvanians, um, uh, including uh, New York and New Hampshire troops, um, and a brigade under um, Brigadier General Clinton that came down from the Mohawk Valley and joined them. One um, battle at Newtown near Elmira, and then the destruction of scores of um, uh, Haudenosaunee Ir Iroquois settlements. Uh, that definitely meant for a hard winter. Most of the um, Onondaga and Seneca and Cayuga nation uh, reliant on British supplies at Fort Niagara to get through that winter. And all that did was prompt further raids the next year. <laughs> and in fact, the year after that, the, the New York frontier never settled down. Most of us, uh, unless you live there, um, have the, the, the conventional story of the revolution shifting to the South. Well, up here, there was plenty going on um, well into late 1781. Um, at this point, um, Sir John Johnston has um, the opportunity to lead a couple of raids into the Valley, both to destroy um, cropland and to gain recruits. Uh, one happens earlier in the year um, and definitely affects the same region between Schoharie and, and Stone Arabia and Kanajahari that um, the later fights happen in. Um, then um, Captain Joseph Brandt, um, a commissioned uh, Mohawk war leader, uh, leads another raid. And finally, the one that is the centerpiece of this story that involves a movement 
uh, down from Oswego, up through Onadilla, into the Schoharie Valley, led by Sir John Johnston, um, that encounters Massachusetts and, and New York militia. And it's the centerpiece of the story that we're gonna talk about. So we're looking at contested land and land that is um, full of people with um, divided loyalties of, of neighbors who know their neighbors and know where they stand. Um, and in some cases, uh, punitive actions taken uh, against those of the other persuasion. So filling Can the ranks. Yes? Unidilla. Yes? You, Unidilla. 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 Thank you, sir. Unidilla it is. Um, filling the ranks of the Continental Army was never um, possible to do fully. Um, but it also meant that instead of signing people up for three years or the war, if you needed extra troops, you called for uh, levies on the state militia for part-time continental service or for supplemental service as state troops. And there were two calls for this in June of 1780. The first was for six months volunteers in Massachusetts and they wanted well over 3000 men. And every town had a quota. And you could fill it by drafts on your militia companies or you could fill it by um, youngest sons or you could hire a substitute or you could grab a, a ne'er-do-well wandering by um, but you needed to try to meet those numbers if you could, and there were fines if you couldn't. And two weeks later, they asked for another 4,000 and change. But those were three months men, and those are the men Brown ended up with. So they've already scraped the bottom of the barrel to send six-month troops out to help bolster Washington and to start thinking about what's going on on the New York frontier. And now they have to do it again. And if you look at who's exempt here in Massachusetts, that's interesting. If you're, if you're involved with uh, Harvard College or if you're a minister, you can get off. But if you're between 16 and uh, uh, 50, um, or, or really as high as they go, they, you could be called. And, and that is indeed what I've seen as I've started to look at the names of the men who ended up with Brown. They are predominantly quite young. Um, they are, they are folks who may not have served before, unless they're the officers. And some of them are a little long in the tooth, which is to take nothing away from their desire to be useful. Um, but these are not um, seasoned frontline troops. These are militia sh serving short-term engagements. Brown ends up with five companies, which is much less than he was supposed to have. He is made the colonel of this regiment of three months men. Um, with him is Major Oliver Root. Uh, adjutant is uh, Easton, his, his old buddy Easton's uh, son. Uh, the surgeon's a fellow named Oliver Brewster, who you'll meet again, who's from Beckett. And then there are five companies, four of which are Berkshire County, and one of which is what was then Hampshire County and is now largely Hamden County. Um, interesting when you look at the spread of this. Uh, William Ford's men were um, largely from the central part of the county. So there's a possibility that they would have had family alliances in Lanesboro or Pittsfield or West Stockbridge. Might be neighbors or might be near a family. Mitch, when you get back, you may wanna just mute. Your camel corps is, is galloping a little loud. Um, Captain uh, Spur or Spoor, it's a Dutch name, it's spelled both ways, uh, was from Sheffield, but he seems to have men more spread out, including some Williamstown folks. Um, William White, that's definitely a North County group, uh, and it's the smallest one. He's got about 64 men. Samuel Warner has men largely from the southeastern part of the county, the Hill Towns and Sandusfield and New Marlboro and um, what's now Tearingham. And then there's Captain Levy or Levi Ely from West Springfield. He's got 81 men from both sides of the river, um, but mostly on the west side of the Connecticut River. And that's the odd unit out although there are some places where he's got a few folks from the Berkshire towns. That's, those are the folks from, from the other side of the mountains who are with him. 
bring it right down to Great Barrington. Great Barrington was meant to send 12 men. These are their names um, because they very kindly remembered to record that in their town history. Um, three of them did not come back. Um, and one who came back had been left for dead and scalped. So that's a pretty heavy hit. That, that's um, a quarter casualties for those 12 men. And there are some towns that saw those kinds of numbers at Stone Arabia and the next day's fighting as well. By the end of July, Washington is worried. There, the, the raids that have happened in the Mohawk Valley um, have, have made him very concerned about the security of that area um, and the harvest, which is especially important. It's a very important wheat producing region. And as you can see, when you consider how very essential the post of Fort Schuyler is to the security of our whole frontier, the saving of the harvest of the fine country upon the Mohawk River depends upon an immediate removal of the enemy. I'm convinced you will not lose any time in marching off a detachment. He sends this letter to Brigadier General Fellows, who's in charge of the Berkshire militia, and says, I, I need 500 men. Send them all here. Send them to Colonel Von Skoik right now. Um, don't send them down the river to me. And Fellows writes back and says, um, I got your letter. I sent Major Root, that's the second in command of Browns, to see who we can find in Claverack, but there's only 35 men there. And so basically, you've got the 300 with Brown and whoever else I can grab. That's it. Uh, very sorry. My compliments to General Von Rensselaer. Here in the pension declarations of men who were with Brown, there's some really interesting tidbits. And I'll pause for a second to say how I think we should treat their statements. Those of you who are familiar with this time period know that um, militia aren't really afforded the opportunity to apply for a pension from the federal government until the 1830s, by which time they're old men. And they have to give detailed descriptions of their service in order to, to prove that they did indeed serve the requisite number of days. Um, and so they often include details that um, are misleading because they remember them wrong or that are fascinatingly apt because they have no reason to make that stuff up. That's what they saw, that's what they thought. But I think it's also important to note that a private soldier in a frontier battle is going to experience a piece of it and hear other things about it. And so discounting it as a singular statement is probably wise. When eight or nine people say the same thing, and they say it at different time periods, you have to spend more time thinking about it. And that's proven to be the case looking at these pension declarations. But they've helped me understand, for example, how Brown's men got where they were. They went piecemeal and they weren't even expecting it. And some of them didn't even go as whole companies until they finally got out there. William White Jr., whose dad is the uh, captain in charge of White's company says um, that he joined the regiment in Pittsfield and marched as he thought for White Plains. Um, but at that point, Colonel Brown, who was apparently with White, um, received news in Flaverack that they should actually go to the Mohawk Valley. So they went that way. Aaron Francis of Westfield, who was in Ely's company, said that he thought he was actually meant to go to West Point, but then they received orders to march through Great Barrington and up to Albany. And they marched all the way up into Fort Plain and then to the Palatine settlements, um, and they were kept there guarding the inhabitants. Silas Underwood, who was in Warner's company, and who actually has quite a lot to say about an engagement later in the day after the Battle of Stone Arabia at a place called Clocks Field, said in his declaration that he left Sandusfield to join the company and went to Albany where they were directed to await the arrival of the other militia belonging to the same regiment. And then Captain Ely came up from Springfield uh, with a part of his company and they went on to Schenectady where they found some boats loaded with provisions and stores for the troops at Fort Stanwix, which they guarded up the Mohawk to Fort Plank where he joined his company under Captain Warner. So he's really, he's traveling as a group of loose men just trying to get where they need to be and they need finally gets under the command as opposed to where he's there. And then they went off to guard boats and on other kinds of duties. Another fellow, Nathaniel Babcock from uh, Middlefield, again in Ely's company, said that he was a substitute for his brother um, who had been drafted um, out of his militia company, but he went in his place. Um, and he describes their line of march, again, to Canada Harry, Fort Stanwix. And then he says, 
he was personally stationed for about eight weeks at Fort Windecker, which is a tiny little place, which did not clearly have all 80 plus of Ely's men at it. Um, they were spread about in detachments. And then later, he and most of Ely's men did end up at, as he writes, Stone Robbie, Stone Arabia. Uh, Mount Washington, which is the furthest southwest town in the Berkshires, is where George King was from. Um, he's in uh, Captain Spurs' company. And he described that they, they actually went out and did quite a lot of things in the two or three months that they were there prior to the battle that ended their time. That included scouting to Cherry Valley, bringing back cattle. That included being at different forts. He's naming tiny little outposts. So they are not all clustered together with one or two exceptions um, as companies. They are detachments um, and they have a lot of ground to cover. This is a, a detail from a, a wonderful map that was put together to illustrate uh, not just um, the ravages of uh, Johnson's force as they moved um, up river at the time we're about to discuss, but it also shows all these tiny little spots. There's Fort Clyde, um, there's Fort Plank, there's Fort Windecker. Um, Here's Stone Arabia with Fort Paris just beyond it. Here's a little place called um, Fort um, Kieser, or, uh, which is a, a block house or a fortified stone house that's near where Stone Arabia battlefield was. So those 300 plus Berkshire men are spread all over the place along with um, New York troops for a couple of months. And they're doing the kinds of things you'd expect them to do. They're you know, guarding boats going up river and they're gathering supplies and they're camped out in, in various detached areas. But in the end of August, things get real and an expedition is planned um, that will come down from Oswego uh, with forces gathered under Sir John Johnson um, that include men from Fort Niagara, that include men from Montreal, that include men from um, an island in the Thousand Islands where they picked up a detached company. And the purpose of this uh, was indeed um, to hit him in the harvest. Um, and, and he's very clear uh, that the, the orders that came from General Haldeman are very clear that they thought they had sufficient troops. They could take some from the regulars, some from the, um, the 8th and the 34th, uh, quite a large number of Butler's Rangers quite a large number of their native allies, um, quite a large number of the King's um, Royal Regiment of um, New York Provincials. The actual numbers end up um, almost 900 men. And here's a couple of their leaders. Um, Sir John Johnston there on the left, that's an early portrait of his. I don't know quite when it was painted, but it's certainly a lot, uh, the earliest one I've seen. Um, and on the right, uh, one of the most notable of the uh, Native Americans taking part in this expedition, um, the Andanegia Negia, uh, Joseph Brandt, um, who has a captain's commission and is with the Indian department and is from that area and deeply connected um, to the Johnson family. This is about as close as I guess I'm gonna get to giving you the order of battle for the Crown Forces when they start. Um, and I'm indebted to compilations uh, that um, Gavin Watt did and some others. I tried to break out the numbers of men and who was commanding there. But it's a force of regulars. It includes um, both the Light Infantry Company of the 8th Regiment and of the 34th and another 80 men in detachments from both of those regiments. It includes um, 25 Jaegers that nobody wants who are um, the only Germans on the expedition, but who come along anyway from Hesse Hanau, uh, includes two cannon, a, a, a grasshopper, which is sort of a cannon on a tripod, um, but a three pounder, um, and a, a four inch cohorn royal mortar for lobbing shells into fortifications, something they put to good use later. Quite a large number of provincial soldiers, um, loyalists both in Walter Butler's Butler's Rangers, um, three uh, companies of about 50 men each under these officers. Um, that John McDonnell comes in for quite a lot of praise for what he ends up doing during this fight. We'll talk a bit about him. Um, a larger number uh, from the 1st Battalion of the King's Royal Regiment of New York Provincials, uh, parts of 
five companies there um, and also this independent company. And then the Indian department, which is both uh, led by um, native and European officers and then includes additional uh, members of the six nations I've named a few, but it's a fairly substantial number of them, about 250 to start. They don't all complete the raid, but it's a, it's a substantial force um, and it's capable of, of um, holding its own uh, in the wilderness. They come down diagonally. They, they drop down um, to the southeast rather than following the river and then come into uh, and down um, Schoharie Creek. And uh, so there's the, um, uh, an, another feeder into the Mohawk uh, River that had three substantial forts in it, the upper, middle, and lower forts, and then all these little settlements. One uh, company of Brown's men, Ford's company, is stationed in this area, predominantly at the upper and the middle fort. So they're not available for Stone Arabia, but they are here when the first action takes place. Here's what a couple of them had to say about that. Warren Hull of West Stockbridge says that they marched through Albany to Schoharie in the state of New York where he was stationed it was called the Upper Fort. In the month of October, the British Tories and Indians made an attack upon the Middle Fort at Schoharie and burnt and destroyed the country along Schoharie Creek and the Mohawk. That he with about 300 militia under Major Woolsey pursued the enemy down the Schoharie Creek through the woods, a distance of 35 miles to the Mohawk, thence up the said river to Falk Hill where he was discharged. Azahel Foote of Lee, however, was in the thick of it at the Middle Fort. And he um, actually repeats a rather interesting story of flags of truce being shot upon by a New York um, ranger, um, actually someone who had been from Pennsylvania and had, had fought under Daniel Morgan, uh, so they say. Um, Azahel Foote sa says that he was drafted out of Captain Marsh's company from Stockbridge, put into Fords. He talks about being that he was at Skohari when the Indians came upon it. He was on guard and the first to give the alarm about the break of day. He describes that they brought with them the howitzer and the four pounder for the purpose of throwing in upon the fort shells and balls. As we have then but 70 men in the fort, they commenced their firing upon us for the purpose of burning our magazine. They threw into the fort about a dozen shells which set our magazine on fire three times. Some of our men were brought in mortally wounded. None of them were in Browns. Um, we have in the fort some riflemen from Virginia Rangers who were not subject to the command of our officers. One of them shot down three officers who had been sent by the enemy with a flag of truce. Actually shot at is, is I think more accurate in that no officer was killed and the same officer carried the flag three times. Um, but that's the way he remembered it. Um, and then eventually um, not being able to reduce the fort, um, Johnson moved on and um, these folks followed them. And I think this final description here is interesting. Um, the enemy remained till nightfall when they drew off and commenced their firing on one of the other forts, the lower fort. From thence they went on to what was then called Stone Robbie, to which place we followed them. They've arrived a short time before us. On our way, many cattle lay slaughtered, hardly an animal to be seen, living, seen living, houses smoking in ruins. And when we arrived at Stone Robbie, many of the inhabitants lying in their gore, yet unburied. That's probably a pretty accurate description based on um, the destruction that happened at that place. And now we get to was Brown betrayed or not? Um, this is a copy of a letter that was found on his person, uh, one of two that were sent. Uh, and it was sent at night uh, of October 18th, uh, right before um, the morning when Brown marched out and, and to his doom. And basically it sent over one of his captains, Captain White, it's spelled right, with all the troops that were on that side of the river, and that also um, promised that, th that there would be some support uh, after they left some to defend the garrison uh, on the other side. Um, and this letter basically said, um, you know, reconnoiter and keep an eye on the enemy. A second letter said, um, General Van Rensselaer is coming up the river uh, to hit the enemy in the rear, you should meet their front. And so thus far we know that, that Brown had some orders. Um, here's a, a fairly uh, consistent description of what happened next. This is Daniel Rice from White's company. Um, 
Colonel Brown received orders from General von Rensselaer to turn out and check the advance of the enemy, that he would support him from the rear, that Colonel Brown obeyed the order and with his 130 men, we're gonna hear a lot of different numbers here, uh, engaged the enemy on the 19th day of October, 1780. That in that engagement, Colonel Brown fell with about 40 of his men and the rest unable to oppose such a, fo a force so much superior and not being supported by General von Rensselaer retreated to the fort under the command of Major Oliver Root. This was the only engagement. Uh, he was in this engagement and this was one day after burning of a place down the river. Such as it is, that's not a, a far off description of what happened. Um, he doesn't necessarily read anything into whether General Ron Rensselaer should have supported him or not, just that he wasn't. But let's hear what the British commander has to say about that fight, because it's, it's, it's really instructive. And he left a very long description afterwards. And the salient points are these. It was foggy that morning. And they had troops on both sides of the river moving back up the Mohawk River after burning in the Scary Creek area. And they all crossed over to the north side. He saw a few folks on horses. Um, and he said they fell in with the advance guard who immediately retired upon the Indians advancing. That's Brown's advance guard. When we had gained the heights um, of Stone Arabia, the enemy were discovered and attacked by about 50 Indians. That's those with Brant largely who were forced to give way, but we immediately supported them with a part of the 8th, 34th, and Rangers, Butler's Rangers. The remainder of the troops being at some distance. The fire continued very hot for a few minutes. The enemy were under the cover of a wood and a fence on one side of a lane while we had only the fence and an open field on the other side within 30 yards of them. Finding the Indians were endeavoring to flank them on their right, I ordered Captain McDonnell with the Rangers to attempt their left at the same time leaping over the fence with the 8th and 34th and those are the light companies of the 8th and 34th, not the other 80 men. The enemy immediately gave way when a general pursuit took place in which Colonel Brown and about 100 officers and men were slaughtered. Captain McDonnell of the Rangers and Captain Brandt exerted themselves upon this occasion in a manner that did them honor and contributed greatly to our success. We had only one private of the 8th and three Indians killed. Captain Brandt received a flesh wound in the sole of his foot um, and three Rangers were wounded. By papers found in Colonel Brown's pocket, I learned that General von Rensselaer with 600 militia had three field pieces at Fort Hunter the day before, and of course, could not then be very much distant. So we therefore, without loss of time, began to burn the settlement, which we completed in a short time, the enemy firing upon us from their fort at the same time. So this is what that looks like. In the center, you've got the lane, and this is an adaptation of a map that Gavin Watt kindly put in his book, but which I've corrected in one place. Because that attacked on the right, the Indians attacking on the right, that's the on the enemy's right here. And the Rangers then on their left here. And that's shown, that's shown in Watt's book the other way. But in all other respects, you basically have a meeting engagement here of the advanced forces of the uh, crown which are going to be their lightest troops. It's the two light companies, 35 men each. It's the Rangers with about 50. It's the Indians under Brant with about 50. That's who's leading everybody else down here with the cannons and the Hessians and the, um, and, the, and the rest of the provincials. That's not a large number, but that is what you would expect out front. Brown had been proceeding this way. Here are the fences. There are some scouts out in front, and then there are parts of three companies and a piece of a fourth. Is it 130 men? Is it 160? We'll look into that, but it is not 300 on either side. This is a fight of about 150 men on each side. And it's also, as I just realized, a classic double envelopment, the same that the Zulus did it is in Dwana 99 years later. Right? You got the loins, you got the chest, you got the horns. It's, the, it's exactly what you'd expect. And Brown has the misfortune of being killed right in the beginning of that. And no wonder they break. Right? They're being charged by two companies of light troops, probably who have bayonets. They're being attacked by their um, fiercest adversaries in the Rangers and in the 
native troops and they can't hold and they run and they're tracked down. Nathaniel Babcock in Ely's company um, actually described this pretty well. Um, he does talk about an express coming purporting to be from General Van Rensselaer requiring Colonel Brown to go out and flank the enemy. Says that Brown declined to go saying he thinks it's from the enemy but the Colonel in charge of the fort, Colonel Clock, orders him to go, go calls him a coward, maybe. Brown obeys and goes, the, the declarant went with him. The Rangers had been out, that's now the New York troops, that's the Triumph County Rangers and some Oneida Indians who are with them, and skirmished with the enemy and they piloted Colonel Brown. We met the enemy's advanced guard who led us up to the center of the British force. And then he confuses what happens later with the cannons, which were not there. Two men were shot by the side of the declarant and he saw Colonel Brown fall. This was the first fire of the British from behind the log fence. We retreated to the fort, the enemy nearly flanked us and our men were scattered. The express was a false one, pay 40 shillings a month, not a cent of which was paid. You hear a lot of that from these guys too. They felt abandoned afterwards. So grain of salt for the betrayal piece, but the description of a meeting engagement sounds very close to what Johnston had to say. Here's a few others. Ezekiel Kent of West Springfield. After marching about four miles, we were fired upon by the enemy in ambush when Colonel Brown and Captain Ely and about half the regiment fell. Eh, a little less than that. Uh, they next made their escape to the fort as well as they could. The enemy following them came up near the fort and soon retired and destroyed by burning and otherwise all that came in their way. Paul Noble in Ely's company has an, actually an interesting escape. He follows the locals. Um, and his brother testifying for his widow for a pension later says that he remembered that after the defeat, said Paul was among the first to get into the fort. This is Fort Paris up, up beyond Stone Arabia. And it was inquired how he got in so soon. And he said that he followed some Dutchmen who knew the road through the woods and reached the fort a shorter way. And he thought as the pursuit was so close that Paul must have fallen and said Paul said he should have done so had he not followed the Dutchmen. Well, good for him because a bunch of other folk were not so lucky. And a bunch of other folk were not there. Most of Warner's company uh, were on the other side of the river, including Silas Underwood. But he does give us an interesting detail, which is that Lieutenant Norton was accordingly sent the night before with 17 or 18 men to join Brown. The next morning, Captain Warner with the residue of his company, including this declarant, went down the river to Fort Plain and joined Colonel Dubois' regiment. And while on this march down the river, they saw the smoke of the buildings burning in Stone Arabia and heard the report of the guns. So who do we have with Brown? Most of Ely's company, only 17 or 18 from Warner's, Whites, which is under strength, about 64 men, and many but not all of Spurs company. Josiah Corey in White's company says that about midnight on the night of having gone out on a reconnaissance, they heard the report of a field piece uh, apparently from Fort Paris. So the troops at Fort Plain, among whom he was under the command of Colonel Brown, immediately crossed the River Mohawk and at daylight under Colonel Brown, marched from Fort Bar Paris about two miles. He again mentions the express. He talks about the fight. He says when Brown was killed, Major Oliver Root told them to get to the fort if they could. Part were killed. Some swam across the river to Fort Plain. Some got back to Fort Paris. The enemy burned two large churches at Stone Robbie and everything else they could find. After destroying dwelling houses, barns, stocks of hay and grain, the enemy embodied and marched direct towards Fort Paris, in which he then was. But there being two field pieces in the fort, which were plied so effectively as to prevent their coming nearer than 40 or 50 yards from rods from the fort. And there's actually plenty of documentation of those cannons being fired a couple of times, perhaps even with a broken camp kettle as ammunition. Levi Hanks from Cheshire who's, Cheshire, who's in White's company, said, um, again, that they had marched about a mile and a half, the enemy consisting of 400 British, 400 Tories and Indians, uh, about 100, that's the total force, not the force they met, uh, lying in ambush, rose up and fired on them, killed, uh, killed a considerable number, <laughs> nine out of our company. I haven't found nine out of White's company, but, but I found a, a fair number of casualties there nonetheless, among them Colonel Brown, who had the command. The enemy set fire um, to the town and to all the stacks of hay and grain in the neighborhood, which produced a great conflagration. They fired for some time with muskets into the fort and wounded one man in the head by the name of Slater, Charles Slater, who did not make any serious attack upon the fort. Afterwards, some of our struggling troops returned to the fort, several of whom had been scalped by the Indians. 
detained, detained about a week after my time expired to assist in burying the dead. So you, you can see that some of the some of the sort of camp rumors get repeated, but some of the same themes of who was there and more or less what happened are also repeated. So the, the weight of evidence for it happening more or less the way the British commander described it, are pretty good, except that he thinks he killed far more than he did. Uh, Medad Comstock of Williamstown, who's in Spurs Company, uh, remembered this fight uh, on the Mohawk River uh, and that he was called out to help uh, reinforce the American troops but was driven back into the fort. That means he's in the garrison left at Fort Paris and not with the rest of Spurs. That means Brown doesn't bring the whole company of Spurs company with him when he goes out on his reconnaissance. And Samuel Campbell of Mount Washington who is in Spurs company um, uh, later recounted uh, testifying for his brother William's service that um, his wife's brother was also killed, although it was the next day, and that his brother came back with a hat that had been cut through with a tomahawk in that action. And I, th I think that the hand-to-hand -hand part of the flight through the woods after that uh, was absolutely terrifying and, and not too many prisoners taken and fewer of those left unharmed. George King, also in Spurs Company said um, that he um, actually not there either. He was placed at a spot called Fox's Mills, which is a little bit further up the river, heard about the fighting. And then when the British army were marching past him, they exchanged some shots. This is later in the day, and it's a precursor to a second fight that happens the same day after Brown's defeat at a place um, called um, Clock's Field uh, or Fox's Mills. And Warner's company is there. So the 17 or 18 who were with Brown we know about what happened to one or two of them, uh, but the remainder ended up pursuing uh, Johnson's force and having another engagement late in the afternoon. I won't read all of this, but it, it's actually, it's the best description I've seen of what happened uh, on the uh, right flank of the Patriot forces at that time, uh, includes the back and forth, um, the British at one point feeling like they're lost, he also mentions this guy, um, Seth Jackaways, as a prisoner with the British, and that helps me add another casualty to the list that I didn't know about. Jackaways is a corruption of Jacques, uh, and those folks are from the Sheffield and uh, in Connecticut part of the world, so I think that's where I'll place him, but I haven't definitively seen him. So now we get down to what happened afterwards. Brown is dead. One of his captains, Ely, is dead. Um, 30 or so men are dead, more are wounded. Um, and, and the British have recrossed in darkness um, the river after the second fight of the day. Um, Sir John said that he thought it was mo uh, most for the good of his service to cross the river without loss of time, which soon was effected without any interruption. The Indians led us immediately up into the woods. And it being very dark, we were separated. And this is true, they, they did not move as a body after that on their way back to Oswego, they moved in detachments. And unfortunately, this is where Brown loses more men because along the way, a party of Massachusetts and maybe also New York troops bumped into Captain Andrew Park's light company of Eighth Foot the next day, October 20th, um, on the way to Fort Herkimer. And also Captain John McDonald's uh, from Butler's Rangers. And as is described here, um, Park didn't know how many men he was facing, so um, he moved on, but McDonald attacked them, killed 10, took two prisoners and drove the rest into the fort. I know of five from Browns who were killed. I can name three of them. Two from Spurs Company and three from Warners. So when people are figuring, people also often conflate these two days in the total casualties for Brown, um, which tends to give a sense of more killed at Stone Arabia, but nonetheless, um, significant losses on both days. Afterwards, uh, news was passed on. Um, this particular um, letter was written at Crown Point by an officer who was uh, informing others of what he had heard. In this one, he mentions that five Oneida Indians fell with Brown which is interesting, I believe would have been with the, the New York Rangers um, uh, who had been out in the advanced 
of Brown's party. And then of course, people had to explain what happened further away. James Madison found this to be a great disaster, but it's a disaster of loss of provisions. He wrote quite a number of letters on November 14th about this. Um, here's some of the language. They've totally laid in ashes a fine settlement called Schoharie, which was capable, General Washington says, of yielding no less than 80,000 bushels of grain for public consumption. And that it would have been able from the energy of the government, it's most likely to supply magazines of flour, both to the main army and to the Northwestern Post. That was absolutely one of the accomplishments of the raid. Another was to bring a number of loyalist recruits from some of the settlements uh, in the upper uh, Schoharie area. General George Clinton wrote to Washington about the same time, and he's, he's putting a good light on it. He's talking about what happened in the final mopping up phase, which he was part of, and about the prisoners they took from the scattered um, Crown forces. But look at, look at how he's weighing it. Um, we have taken about 40 prisoners, recovered most of those they had taken from us at Schoharie and other places with the Negroes, cattle, and plunder, property. Right? He by false intelligence, uh, our principal loss is Colonel Brown of the Bay Levies. He by false intelligence was led into the fire of the whole body of the enemy and fell with 39 of his and the militia and levies of this state and two were made prisoner. Whereas the much more immediate impact for local men with Browns are nicely summed up here by Matthew um, Copley of West Springfield in Ely's company. There was a large number of young men from this town in that engagement and more were slain in it from this town than in any other battle during the war. So grand strategy, property destruction, local impact. And that's really what drew me to the story to begin with. Moses Stewart of Westfield and Ely's company said, I was in the Battle of Stone Robbie, so-called. Colonel Brown had the command and was killed and also Captain Ely was killed together with 17 men belonging to the company in which I belong. Americans were overpowered and retreated. I believe that is a portrait of Captain Ely. He is identified as Captain Levi Ely, he is identified as having been painted in 1780. It's the right age for a guy of his stature. If it's not, he gets to stand in. Um, and that's his memorial stone. All of these men are buried in New York near the battlefield, but several of them have memorial stones in local cemeteries. And uh, this particular one is in West Springfield. Um, and it's, an, it's in a marvelous uh, cemetery that uh, uh, one of the people on this call helped me get nice photographs of. So let's look at this. Colonel Brown is killed in Captain Ely's company. Captain Ely is killed. And then all these other people. I have tried to give them their towns where I can find them. There's a few I can't. There's some names that are spelled 15 different ways and it's gonna be really hard to track down. But I've probably put towns to two thirds of them. And it's a, it's a big hit for Westfield. It's a big hit for West Springfield and then scattered about the lower parts of the Pioneer Valley. Here's another stone from that same West Springfield um, cemetery uh, for Asa Day. Day is a big name in Shays Rebellion as well, same family. As for Captain Spoor's company, nine are killed at Stone Arabia, two are killed the next day. They also have a POW who never came home. That's Stephen Root from Great Barrington. Um, and we'll talk a little bit when we finish here in a moment about the, the wounds that the few surviving wounded suffered, but they're all gruesome. Captain White's company has at least two killed um, in the fight. Um, two wounded, including um, Slater, who uh, was shot through the head in the fort, um, and another fellow, Charles Thrasher, um, and another POW. And then Warner's company looks like Seth Jakeways was probably captured at Stone Arabia. He's one of the two who was captured there. But the other three are among those killed the next day in the meeting engagement with Butler's Rangers and the 8th Light Company. Here's another memorial stone for one of Ely's men. Here are the men who um, were from Brown's regiment who were wounded who survived that I know of. And they're all miserable wounds. And, and some of them later received pensions. And in the case of Abner or Abner Peer from Great Barrington, Egremont, his father petitioned 
the Massachusetts uh, Provincial Congress for uh, relief for the wages his son could not provide because he was an invalid for years after that. It's a brutal description. Um, Peer was taken prisoner, then tomahawked, then Now wait, scalped. what was it? Mozzarella, parm, and what? Sorry folks, um, I'll finish up in just a second, then we can hear about dinner. Um, the, the, the last one I wanted to point out here, and again, you can read it for yourself, these are not any of them wounds that you'd expect people to survive. The last one is, is Roswell Woodworth um, from Blanford. He's in Ely's company. The description of his wound is his left arm is shattered near the, sh the shoulder, but he had a whole lot more to say about that injury in his pension declaration. He was treated by Dr. Oliver Brewster, who was the surgeon and other surgeons. And he died in 1812, so he, he managed to move on with that shattered arm. But because it's so engaging, I, I will read you his description of that wound. It's, it's uh, not for the light of stomach. On the 19th of October, 1780, I, Roswell Woodworth, was wounded in the Revolutionary War in an action where Colonel Brown was killed at Stone Robbie on the Mohawk River, in my left arm near the shoulder joint that broke it all to pieces the day before our time was out for three months. Dr. Brewster of Beckett was our surgeon of Colonel Brown's regiment. He took out five pieces of bones. The first time he drew it, Major Oliver Root was present where it was dressed. He was in the action where I was wounded. The next day, we was carried to Schenectady in Bateaux's. Then it hurt me very much to get to Albany Hospital and had to stay there eight months from the second day from the time I was wounded. I had to stay eight months in the hospital. In the latter part of June, 1781, I was carried to Blanford, Mass, where my father lived. And while I was there in that hospital, Dr. Townsend was the head doctor in the hospital all the time I was there. When I went away, I asked him to give me a discharge that would clear me. When I was in the hospital, my arm used to swell up where the bones wanted to come out. And when, when it was time, Dr. Townsend himself cut my arm open six or seven times in that eight months and took out about 20 pieces of bones out of my arm in three or four places between my shoulder and elbow. And when Dr. Brewster, after we got into the fort, when he dressed my arm, he pulled off my coat and down dropped the ball that went through my arm and did not go through my coat sleeve the opposite side. It appeared to be very much battered up. And the doctor pulled out five pieces of bones with his hands and laid them on the floor with the ball. I never seen no more of them. Farewell bullet and them bones. And in that eight months, my arm swelled up pretty bad just um, below my elbow. And when it was time to lance it, Dr. Townsend lanced it himself. There is the scar now there to be seen. And ever since that time, has been a sore close to that scar and always will be as long as I live, I think so. And that's just, you can't make that up. That's, that's just such an authentic, deeply painful recollection. So I'll leave you with this final casualty count. Brown and Eli with 17 men, 11 men out of Spurs Company, nine killed at Stone Arabia. Another wounded and another POW presumed dead. White loses two men killed, two wounded, and one POW. Warren loses three men killed. Yeah, and a POW. I'll cut it into each one. When you add in the additional losses at Stone Arabia of five Oneida and two New York scouts and a, a, a man wounded, you're getting near 40 plus casualties. Just a second. Last image. Here's a 1785 yes. map of Western Massachusetts towns. Yeah. And I have put in the names in black of the men that I know were killed or wounded or prisoner from those towns. And it's about two thirds of Brown's men that I've been able to do that. And they stretch from Williamstown to Great Barrington, to Wilbraham, <laughs> a lot in West Springfield, a lot in West yes. Hills. Half a dozen is the highest number I've got for certain towns. So yeah. I'll stop sharing my screen here and I will, uh, I'll just leave it with this thought. 
I don't know whether Brown really was deceived by a false, um, a false order. Clearly many people at the time thought he was, but I think his defeat can be just as easily explained as a meeting engagement of a very active um, and aggressive uh, detachment of light troops and rangers on the Crown Forces side with Brown's men marching in column. Brown being killed very early on and the command being decimated and men who have one more day to serve before their enlistment is up breaking and running. I think that's a probably as good an explanation as we're going to get. That's what I got for you, friends. I'm happy to take any questions you've got. Who, who knows? <laughs> Am I done? I know I had already. Uh, are verbal questions? Yeah, absolutely. Or do you want them on chat? Um, okay. I, I'll, I'll take them as they come. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm who's. Familiar... Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. I'm familiar with the area a bit. Uh, I understand there's a there's a road marker, or one of those now New York State road markers. I get it. Uh, and so we actually have a good idea of, of precisely where the battle, particularly that double envelopment, actually occurred. Yes. <laughs> there, there is a road not marker. It's, it's not too far off. If you look at where the, they said they gained the heights. Oh, good for you. And they were coming up a, I talked, a, a creek, I a river, my, a river um, tributary. With Gisela, when I and said off to, to that said, field. Listen, I want to talk to you. Okay. You Thank know you. about weight loss. I said, you know, I. I'm sorry, I, I don't know who hey, that is. Um, yeah, I don't know who that show. iPhone is, but you should be able to mute everybody. If it is the iPhone, I'll just mute it. You could just dump the iPhone. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. It. It's hard for me Excellent. to do things with two hands. I, um, Paul, Mitch. I've been to the spot about six or eight dozen times. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh -huh. not very far from my home. I've, sc I've scouted it out actually for British Brigade Cotton Line events a couple of times to take a look at it for how it might work for us. I've walked the battlefield six ways from Sunday. It's a lot more open a ground now than it was at the time. There were a lot more hedgerows. You might think of it as something that the uh, soldiers might have seen a little after D-Day um, mm -hmm. at that time because the farmer's fields were much smaller in the hedgerows. And when they talk about there being a fence, the fence was, you know, a, a hedgerow type fence as well with a lot mm -hmm. of stumps in it. Mm -hmm. um, so to be flanked in that sort of country was easier to do than it might be on the field when you walk there. Now it's hard to get a good picture of mm -hmm. what it would have looked like. There was a British Brigade event there many years ago, maybe yes. 20. Oh, more than that. It was yeah. in the mid well, mid yeah, mid '80s. It was one of the very first years the Continental Line British Brigade got together. Yeah. So there's a Ten question nerds. here from Glenn. I want to make sure I catch that. Um, I think the question was, do we know what the remainder of um, the Eighth and Thirty Fourth and, and Crown Forces were doing um, that were not engaged in that in that uh, in that fight, and they, they were dragging cannons and moving up in column from the river. And, and reach the heights after Brown's men broke. And then they were really doing a good job of burning uh, Stone Arabia and, and um, taking shots at Fort Paris. There, there are folks like on this call who know this battlefield intimately. So um, uh, challenge away, I'm, I'm a, you know, a, a fairly reasonable amateur. Tim, I don't have anything to challenge you with, but um, just to add about that roadside marker, yep. uh, where, you, where you see the state roadside marker, which we replaced with that one you showed in the beginning, that new uh, red and yep. uh, blue one. If you look into the cornfield there, there is a boulder that approximately marks the spot where John Brown was fell. Mm -hmm. And there is there is an inscription on the boulder and stuff like that. So I'm not sure if you've seen that one or not. I can send that to you. I've, I've heard... Um, but not seen that there was a stand made at that or at a boulder uh, at, by about half a dozen men who eventually died and may have been buried near there. But um, others will know whether that's apocryphal or not. Yeah, I think I'm not sure. Norm Bolin on the call would probably know a little bit more. I think the boulder was put there after just to yeah, mark the I, spot. Yeah, can you hear fell. me? Yeah, I can, can hear you. Norm. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, that boulder, I, I believe, was added later okay. on. There is yeah. a story about men defending from uh, behind a boulder. I just don't think it was that one. There's but it's a, a lot of uh, the boulder is interesting. It's got a nice inscription on it uh, yeah. there, that, and it explains uh, about where Colonel Brown was killed. Sure. Uh, uh, I think it says 410 yards or something, southwest, southwest. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a nice image done by Rufus Grider of the boulder. Uh, in the 1886. In fact, that's about when I think they placed the boulder there. Right. Yeah. I can send you a copy of it so you can see it. Terrific. Yeah. I have, um, as you might imagine, um, a huge database of the pension documents and others that I've quoted from here, and I'm more than happy to send them with their reference numbers to any who are interested. Yeah, also, we too, have you. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. I was just going to add, have you used the Massachusetts, uh, I think it's called Soldiers and Sailors volumes? Yes. Yeah, that's Jim Morrison, the local historian here, who actually supplied Gavin Watt with a lot of the Mohawk Valley information for his books. Yeah, it goes heavily off those. And, and uh, Yeah, I've gone through those sense. extensively, um, found a couple names that were um, not included in earlier rosters of people who um, were listed as presumed dead. Um, and some of the pension declarations unearthed names that were not listed that way also. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Norm, maybe you can speak to this, but um, any of the people that I've talked to who uh, were uh, looking for artifacts in the area, um, <laughs> we're, we're looking about um, 400 yards to the west um, of where that boulder was, um, or east, I mean, of where the boulder was. Mm. And so the, the, the majority of what they were finding was a little further away from the the, the boulder or the center of where the battle might have been. Um, yeah, that those fields over there where the boulder is, that's uh, it's an Amish guy that owns that. So yeah. we haven't done much exploring around there because really you should have permission uh, before we go oh, looking yeah. on those properties. You know, we do have uh, work with people, uh, metal detectors that where you have permission to go on the fields. But that battle really, from where that boulder you're talking about, and also our new historic marker sign right there in Route 10, uh, you know, it, it really kind of starts there. But then the, it's sort of this fighting retreat that kind of works its way right across Stone Arabia back to Fort Paris, and then even continues on past there and work as it works through all the farms. I think they broke into. It looked to me like they broke into three columns as they swept across Stone Arabia and burned all the farms. So we've been uh, we've been making arrangements to put historic markers at uh, at uh, a lot of the farms that were burned because a lot some of those farms are still there and owned by the same families. Uh, so we'll we'll have markers in front of the some we already have and some we we've got maybe four more in the next year or so that we're going to get done. And then of course that battle sweeps down the Stone Arabia Road, which takes you back to the Mohawk River right. and then breaks into the Battle of Clocks Field. So. Right now, we have a National Park Service study underway. Uh, Wade Katz uh, from South R River Heritage Consulting is is putting together all the data. We've been working on it for over a year. And um, uh, I have a feeling when we get done, it's really going to be looked at as one uh, large, larger theater of operations with, mm -hmm. with these two battles really being one big running battle. Sure. Uh, uh, all, all happening that, that day. That Silas Underwood pension, which for, you, know, you probably have encountered, but it, it is really detailed and, yeah. and interesting um, in those recollections for all, all two or but, half days of that. But I tell you, you have some interesting things there that you know maybe Wade Katz, our consultant, would like to would like sure. to at least look at. Uh, he may have all this already. You know, there's so much data coming at you all the time. I can't keep it all straight. Uh, but uh, but you certainly got some cool stuff from uh, from over your way. So I think they'd love to take a look at it. We sure. it's funny. We were just talking. We were uh, doing a, a grant application tonight. Uh, we're talking about putting a bronze plaque uh, at the Stone Arabia Church, which is mm. the home of the Stone Arabia Preservation Society. And uh, we we're going to do a bronze plaque with all the casualties. So they were asking me and I said, well, I know there's at least 30, but I, I'd have to go look and see uh, exactly how many all together. So we're going to try and get as accurate a count as we can on the casualties, get them onto a nice monument. And then we're talking about a bronze statue and, you know, all that. It's going to take some time to raise money. But uh, but uh, but it's nice that other people are taking an interest in this. Yeah. 
Well, it's fun. It's fun to add a little something to um, what is rightly a New York story, um, but to add the, the Bay State perspective, perhaps. Um, yeah. Well, you know, and I I I wrote up the uh, uh, the wording on that uh, that new historic marker, and I really wanted something in there about. Uh, uh, the Western Massachusetts uh, Berkshire militia, you know, uh, being involved in it. The old marker just said Brown's, Brown was killed and, right. and the forces were defeated. And I didn't really like that wording there. And mm -hmm. not to mention the fact that, you know, they were part of a bigger uh, operation there that was ultimately, uh, ultimately considered American victory. So I, sure. I, so I, I changed that wording around quite a bit and make sure I gave uh, recognition to the Massachusetts guys that were in on it too. Well, I, I'm I, on, on their behalf. We are grateful. Uh, for, for me, the story of of the Pioneer Valley, the the, the folks in the West Springfield and and, and Westfield area under um, Ely uh, is the real eye opener, right? We we knew that he, the captain was killed. We knew they had a lot of casualties, but that's they 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 were the outliers in that group, right? And they didn't have the same kin relationships that others in the Berkshires might have. Although there are there is some crossover from from Westfield to Berkshire County, um, and and some of those quotes about you know our town never lost more men than in this fight. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, well we've we've acquired two large collections of artifacts off that battlefield uh, that uh, uh, really. Uh, big collection of uh, musket balls, chewed musket balls, you know, with teeth marks in them, sure. uh, and uh, a lot of coins, buckles. Uh, uh, the, our local history books talk about the, that uh, they didn't really have much ammunition for the cannons, yes. uh, so they broke up stove pieces and fired them out. Well, all of the, well, I can't say all of them, but big piles of stove pieces have been recovered off the field around Fort Paris over the years. So we have this big collection of it. Some of it I've been able to actually piece back together. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle with a lot of pieces missing, but, but uh, they were uh, stove plates, firebacks uh, and, and iron bars that they broke into pieces and sprayed them out uh, um, uh, at the enemy near the fort there as they were trying to burn the town. So we got some cool stuff. That's all at the Fort Plain Museum uh, right now. So. Well, you all are, are great to uh, take this time to, to hear someone tell your story uh, with, with perhaps a slightly different twist here or there. I, I appreciate the interest and the expertise. Uh, on, on behalf of uh, Great Barrington Libraries, we'll, uh, we'll continue to try and bring interesting stories out to folk. Uh, and uh, if they're of interest to you, why, why do join us? Yeah, yeah well, great job, Tim. I Thank you, it. Tim. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone had a great, uh, thank great you. Uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, thank, um, thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, it has been recorded, and so it'll probably be up online another week or so. Excellent. All, right. All, All right. the best. Thank you, Sam. Great job. Good evening. Right. Thank, thank you for everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Indeed. Talia, for putting this together. Good Thumbs to see up you from more. Talia. <laughs> All right. Good night, friends. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night guys. Bye, buddy.